So, yeah, introduction to Ayurveda. So I'm very passionate this this subject. Uh, Ayur means life, Veda means knowledge or um, science of the Hindu culture. So it's a life knowledge, a life science. And traditionally, uh, Ayurveda and yoga, when taught together, allow a deepening of each. So yoga is the, that their sister sciences, yoga is the spiritual side of Ayurveda, and Ayurveda is the healing side of yoga. So when they're introduced and work with together, there's a much stronger possibility uh, of a deepening of understanding, okay? So, one of the things I like to talk about when, when I'm going into the subject is three things. Discover it, what is it, where did it come from, why is it useful to have this, this information, uh, understanding it. Uh, very, very important, we'll go into that. How does it show itself in us? Uh, what are the physical, what are the psychological characteristics of Ayurveda within us? And then how do we apply it? So, how can we use it in our lives? As I said earlier, this information can't just stay as intellect. It has to go through an experience to become self-knowledge. Otherwise, it's just something we read about that was somebody else's experience, maybe. And it was useful, but it's not as real as it could be. It's just like when you're doing a yoga practice, right? You can, you can watch videos on Ashtanga, and you can see how people are flowing, but you have no direct experience of it until you do it. And this would be no different. So discover, understand, and apply it. So discover what it is, how it can benefit your life. And we're going to talk specifically towards the end of this about yoga as well. OK? So Ayurveda, life science, life knowledge, uh, supposedly the oldest healing system in the world. What's really important is it takes into consideration mind, body, and spirit collectively i.e. it deals with them at the same time. Uh, sister science of yoga, and as I said before, yoga is the spiritual side of Ayurveda, and Ayurveda is the healing side of yoga. So when we introduce and when we work with them together, they fit, it works, and there's a much better understanding of, uh, ultimately, spirit of self. So there's some really important things um, within Ayurveda. We're looking uh, for two things that help bring us balance. Ayurveda is all about balance. It's about balancing our mind, body, and spirit collectively. It's about balancing our biological constitution, who we are. And when we look at this, there are two influences that we can introduce. One is diet and one is lifestyle, outside and inside influences. Um, so it's a way to support uh, our unique nature, our biological constitution. Uh, and it provides practical, sustainable tools. So when we learn to apply these, it's what is practical? How can I use it? How is it sustainable? Why would I continue using it? It must have some benefit. So when we start to see the benefits of how Ayurveda works, it's almost like we're hooked. And we can go, ah, if that works, what else can I do? And this is where it starts to go into a deeper level, just as it would do with your yoga asana. Ah, oh, these sun salutations, this is nice, I feel good with this. What, what's next? And then we go through a sequence, if you like. And then the benefits start to show themselves. The fruits, if you like, become apparent. So to gain, gain a deeper understanding of self, facilitating self-knowledge, and to experience our natural state. So one of the really, really important things to know is when we balance ourselves on a mind and body basis, and we'll go into what the doshas are, our biological constitution. When we balance mind and body, spirit has a better chance of shining through. So things like creativity, when we're balanced on a mind and a, and a, and a physical basis, other things start to come through. There's clarity. And I'll go into some more detail about this and how it shows itself in a yoga asana practice as well. So how it can benefit our yoga practice. It can give it more depth, more awareness, more connection, more union. So we're going from the physical. The physical, the asana, is the foot in the door. And then we're going on to the more subtle things, you know, about how we use breath and, and, and connection. And then we're looking at diet. You know, I'm doing this yoga practice, and, and now I'm more aware of what I'm eating. So what are the other things that can help provide this, this richness and this depth and this connection? And diet is coming in more and more with that. And then we start to look at lifestyle, and how can my lifestyle support the kind of yoga that I'm, that I'm flowing with? And because of that, this clarity of what's coming through about how I wish to live. 
how I wish to be in the world. So this is all about what Ayurveda is. And then really understanding it is the philosophy. So a little bit of science, not too much. So Ayurveda states that everything in the universe is made up of the five elements, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, of which human beings are part of that. So we all have these five elements uh, in, uh, that make up our biological constitution that are split into three energies, or doshas, um, which are vata, pitta, and kapha. So we, all, we have all three of these in us, okay? So we have five elements into three doshas, three energies. We all have all three, but we all have a unique combination of these three. So you might hear it said sometimes when people are talking about Ayurveda, this person is pitta, or this person is vata pitta. So what that means is that we have normally uh, more of one of these doshas in our constitution than the others. You can have, uh, people say you're predominant with vata, or you're predominant with pitta, or you're predominant with kapha. So sometimes, not very often, people have a natural balance of all three of these in their constitution. So vata, pitta, kapha are the same level in their biological constitution. Now, this constitution is given at conception. So what mom and dad look like, what they did for a living, their characteristics all bear a relevance to who we are. There's a DNA with this. So to understand Ayurveda within ourselves is to understand the mental and the physical characteristics of the doshas. So effectively, the three doshas. Vata is air, contained in ether or space. Pitta is fire, contained in water. So a good example of that, fire contained in water, is the blood. It also happens to be a red color, which is the heating kind of color. And kapha is water contained in earth. So when we bring it down even further, we need to understand what are the mental and physical characteristics of air, what are the mental and physical characteristics of fire, and what are the mental and physical characteristics of water. And, and how, Justin, how do they show themselves in me? OK, so this is what we're going to look into. So before I go into this, what's really important to note is that Ayurveda is about balancing our biological constitution. So we have all three of these doshas, OK? So, for instance, if I am predominant in vata, I have more vata than kapha and pitta. Then maybe the next dosha I have most of is pitta. So someone could say, this person is vata pitta. And then I have kapha, but it's, it's slightly less. So it's not about bringing all three of those into balance. It's about balancing our unique combination of those that we are actually born with. Does that make sense? Yeah? So if you think about uh, biological constitution, your doshas, think of a Mercedes car, okay? Mercedes car is manufactured, and it's a horizontal line all the way through the life of that car. It's always going to be a Mercedes, and then it will fall apart. At any one moment, it is in a state of good or bad, because things are going right or wrong. Maybe the tires are, are bald, maybe the tire tread is good, the oil is bad, the engine is not running properly. This is current situation. So we're just looking to balance our natural state with Ayurveda. I'll go through more of this. But to understand and recognize these doshas in us, we have to understand psychological and physical characteristics. So when you look at the tests that you can do online for Ayurveda, it'll put people in different body types. So a vata person is uh, tall or they're short, but they tend to be thinner. They'll find it harder to put on weight. They'll be very quick. They'll do things with a lot of speed. They'll be quite erratic. Um, why is that? Well, vata is air in ether. It moves like the wind. And what are the characteristics of wind? It's very changeable. It's very quick. It's very erratic. Um, when we look at some of the psychological characteristics, you'll see some of these in yourself. This is where it gets interesting. Okay? And don't worry. It's not better to have more vata or more kapha or more pitta. It doesn't matter because some people go, yeah, that kapha one, I'm not too sure about it. It's a bit like dull and it's a bit like lethargic. I, I don't want that. I think I'm more pitta. But it doesn't matter. So vata, like the wind, it's changeable. Easy come, easy go. This isn't just how we move. These are our psychological characteristics. So how are we with money? Easy come, easy go. 
How is my memory? Uh, yes, I remembered that, and then five minutes later, I've forgotten what it is. Easy come, easy go. This is how we start to recognize some of these characteristics. Uh, there's a lightness also. What does wind do? It dries things out. It's very much on the surface. So when we look at some of these um, characteristics, they can become quite interesting because Vata people can be highly sociable. So they will know everybody in the room or they want to get to know everybody, but they won't have very many friends because it's very much on the surface, like the wind. It's much up here. Um, starts and stops quickly. That can be how we practice yoga. It can be, uh, I have this desire to do something, I'm going to go out and do that, and five minutes later you change your mind. So a little less stamina maybe, a little less focus, because everything's a bit more up here. Um, so we can look at what people do for careers and jobs. Generally, Avata people will be very good teachers because they can hold a number of different topics, a number of different people in the room at the same time. They can hold that, there's a lot going on, when in balance. Uh, very good artists, good musicians, generally. None of these things are definitive, okay? They're all examples. And what happens when we're defining who we are is that we go through this process of questions and answers on our physical appearance, on our mental characteristics. And when we're having a consultation, then we make notes. So, right, okay, we go through a series of questions. And at the end of it, we're left with this pot of information. So what do I have more, a vata tendency, pitta tendency, or kapha? And this is how we define our constitution. Okay. So physical characteristics, thin features. So vata people, because they're predominant with uh, air in ether, they don't have much water in their constitution, or not as much. So they won't gravitate to drinking that much water, because we gravitate towards who we are quite often. Uh, and I'll give some examples of this as well, because vata people will attract vata people. Um, so, Vata won't drink much water, so they'll probably get dry skin. Again, what does air do anyway? Well, like the wind, it dries things out. So they'll probably have drier hair, they might have drier skin. Um, they will not have as good a circulation. So have you ever heard, I, I'm cold to the bone? You know, even in a moderately warm climate, Vata people will have cold hands and cold feet because it takes a while for the circulation, because it's more on the surface. Um, and then we can look at other kind of physical features. Uh, one I like to use, because I've got them, is crooked teeth, because the teeth are erratic. They're all over the place a little bit. So we can look at people's teeth. We can look at so many different things. Um, so remember, this is a life knowledge, so we can look at everything that we do in life to give us clues. The more clues we have, the more definitive the picture on what our constitution is. So there are so many examples. These are just a few that we can look at for Vata. And then we go on to Pitta. So what is Pitta? Pitta is fire. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at the flame, any flame, the hottest part is the tip. So there's a lot of focus there. The heat is very focused at that point. A lot of stimulation, a lot of heat. So when we look at the psychological characteristics of Pitta people, Pitta predominant when Pitta is more than the other two. Then there will be a lot of fiery kind of uh, impulses, let's say. A lot of irrit irritability that can come, uh, a lot of heat, a lot of strong will, a lot of competitiveness, uh, a lot of wishing to do things correctly. Uh, people, Pitta people will listen to others, but they'll generally do their own thing. Uh, very focused, very driven. You've ever heard that phrase, they burnt themselves out? Mm, that's a Pitta person. The fire went too much, and then it burnt out. So it was out of balance. Um, and we'll see some of these characteristics. I can already see smiles happening. This is, what, this is great. We start to recognize this. And this is us understanding Ayurveda in ourselves. So leaders, Pitta people are more leaders than they are followers. They're quite judgmental, quite self-critical of themselves before they are of other people, generally. Um, they like structure. Now, an example I like to use uh, is quite often a pitta person will have a list. So this is what I'm doing tomorrow. So I'm going to yoga, my mat's there, everything's there. After that, I've got a meeting, and then I've got lunch at this time. And, and you see there's a structure to this. Uh, and they, they like structure. Tendency is, when we go out of balance, we have too much structure, and everything becomes a bit like this and too tight. Um, 
They're also very good in terms of jobs. Again, these are not definitive. These are just examples. Pitta people will tend towards jobs that have structure. Uh, so police force, um, politicians, uh, they're very good in terms of getting their message across. Um, they make very good psychologists because there's a need to know. Pitta people want to know how things work. How do, how do I work? What is this life all about? What is going on in this? So things where there's a, that depth of kind of inquiry, let's say. So engineers, you know, this kind of thing. How do these things work? Not just the human body. How do these things work? Um, scientists, again, for the same reason. Lawyers, police, fire people, military, all for this kind of structure. Uh, and then we look at the physical characteristics. So Vata is here, okay? Vata is up here. It's air contained in space. Pitta, fire contained in water. So it's more medium build. So a Vata person will be tall or short, but thin, generally. Um, and a Pitta person will be more of a moderate build. So not just size, but a little bit more muscly, but they'll have average size features. So their eyes will be an average size, their ears, their nose, their feet will be an average size relative to their own body. Whereas a Vata person will have very long, thin feet. They'll have long arms. So when you're looking at yoga practitioners, the ones that are bending into all these wonderful positions that we hope to get to at some point, they tend to have longer arms and longer legs, tend to maybe be more Vata as well. Um, so Pitta's more in the middle in terms of the body size. Uh, in guys, I'll just throw a few examples out there. There's so many that I'll just put a few in. Balding and going grey at an early age can be quite common for guys um, with pitta. Moles as well, lots of freckles can be another sign. Um, so many things that we can look at. Gums could easily bleed because uh, they're very sensitive. Blood, another thing to do with pitta. What is blood in terms of colour? It's red. What is red? It's a heating colour. So this is how it shows itself. And then we look at kapha, psychological characteristics. Vata's up here, Pitta's in the middle, Kapha's more grounded. So it's water contained in earth. So Kapha people tend to hold a lot more weight. Well, if we think of the human body, 77% of the human body is water. Kapha people will gravitate to more drinking more water because they gravitate towards who they are, and they are water predominantly. Um, so they're more heavy, they're more grounded. Emotionally, they're a bit more watery. Um, Whereas Vata people are very sociable like this, and they'll want to know everybody in the party, or they'll get to know everybody in the room. Pitta people, a bit more focused. I'd like to speak to that person and that person later. More structure, more focus. Kapha person is more insular. So they're not as outward going. So they're very good listeners normally. Very patient. Um, very community based, very family based. Won't travel as much. This kind of thing. Um, very loyal. Uh, loving and patient, not that the other two doshas aren't, but generally Kafir is more aligned in this way. Uh, take a while to get going, stamina. So this can be whether we're learning, uh, whether we're running. I mean, a 100 meter runner is not going to be a Kafir predominant person. They're more likely to be a Pitta and an Avata. And if we used a 100 meter running as an example, a Vata person would be out of the blocks like, like lightning. 50 meters would be like, Phew. I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of done. Pitta, I'm just going to get there. I'm going to push myself. I'm really going to get there. More like to be two or three or 400 meter runner. Marathon runner may be more kapha. Takes them a while to get going, but once they get going, they have a lot of stamina, a lot of endurance. They're probably not going to be a competitive runner because they're not really that competitive. But this is how it can start to show itself. Um, so jobs for kapha. Again, not definitive, just some examples. Uh, good chefs. Not because they like eating, necessarily, okay? There's sometimes this thing with kapha that kapha people are overweight. It's not always like that, not when in balance. What is the process of cooking? If we look at what the characteristic of kapha is, and it's water contained in the earth, it's a slowing down. They're, they're a lot more lethargic than the other two doshas. So the process of cooking a meal, of cutting everything, of, of preparing it, takes time. A vata person that's predominant won't generally want to spend that much time on it because it's not who they are. They'll be like, take away, or it'll be food on the go, or it'll be, yeah, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do food tonight, but we'll get a takeaway. And whereas a kapha person will want to spend more time because that's who they are. Um, singers, and we can look at voice types. Generally, you know, vata people have a higher pitch voice. 
Um, Peter people, more moderate, and then there's a deep, resonating kind of voice that comes with Kaffir. Just some examples. And then the physical characteristics. So Kaffir people will have bigger, larger features. It's the opposite to Vata. Um, so we could say they have not necessarily fatter, but they might have wider frame, bigger shoulders. They'll have big feet, but they'll be wider rather than thin. They'll have hands like spades. Have you heard that term before? They have very wide hands. The fingers may be a little bit more uh, chubby, let's say, or, or thicker, whereas a Vata person will have pianist fingers, these long, elegant fingers, maybe. There's no judgment with any of this, okay? It's all observational. The more we can observe, the more we can use it. So the other thing that Kaffir have is more water. So how does that show itself in the body? Will they have more oil in the body? So the joints will be stronger. A vata person will be clicking their joints because what is that? That's air in bone. So there's not as much fluid there. So Kaffir people will normally have stronger joints. And when we come into yoga asana, this is really important to start to look at how we can use these in our yoga asana practice. So uh, Kaffir people, a lot of stamina, a lot of strength. What they need is a little bit more vitality to get going a little bit more. So then we look into our unique combination. Well, I've already spoken to that a little bit. It's not about bringing those three in balance. This person is Vata Pitta predominant, and they have Kaffir, let's say. More Vata, second is Pitta, third is Kaffir. Our biological uh, constitution, given at conception by mom and dad, that goes through all the way to our life and very, very rarely changes unless it's a long-term disease. This is called Prakriti. Biological constitution, your doshic makeup, if you like, Prakriti. Lots of words going in here. So what is it? Uh, it's our physical and mental nature, okay? Physical and mental, we haven't got into spirit yet. When you balance physical and mental, spirit shines through more, and we'll come on more to that. It's given to us by mom and dad at conception, remains unchanged throughout our life. Current state of the doshas. So, biological constitution, who I am, what's the current situation? Current situation of out of balance of the doshas is called vikriti. So, for instance, vata was there, but now it's dropped down here. Pitta's gone up. So Pitta's gone up, Vata's dropped down. So what we could say about this person is that if we looked at the previous slide, they were Vata Pitta predominant, but at the moment Pitta is uh, the one that we need to work with because it's the highest one. So we look at what's out of balance, which is our Vikriti. So we treat Vikriti first, but we have to know Prakriti, biological constitution, first. So what affects Vikriti? How do I know when it's in and out of balance? What can, I, what can I do to bring it back into balance? Well, lifestyle and diet, inside, outside influences. Ayurveda recognizes using the right diet and the right lifestyle to bring us in and out of balance. So the two main tools that we can use. Yoga fits within lifestyle. Um, they all interlink. We all know that. What we put into our body will affect our mind. What we do with our mind will affect our body. So they're all interlinking in many ways. But we look at diet and lifestyle first. So how can I tell if I'm out of balance? I love how the toilet's the one that's right in the middle with this, but it's very relevant. So vitality, what are my energy levels like? Do I wake up in the morning feeling tired still? Did I get enough sleep? Um, am I processing the food that I take in my body out through my body? Is it getting stuck? Is it um, indigestion? Is it constipation? How is it showing itself? Uh, my mood, my stress levels, how do, I st how do I show stress? I'll give you an example. A Vata person, um, very, very sociable. Vata controls the nervous system also, what passes things around the body. Think of the wind, the air again, what passes things around. So a Vata person, uh, very, very good with social media, very, very good stimulation, always on the go. When Vata gets too high, it actually goes into this. So Vata, when it, out of balance, can show itself as being someone that's very reserved. So we have to understand the cause, not just the symptom. Um, if a Pitta person is stressed, you'll know it because they'll be overheating. Their temper will be more uh, on the surface, uh, this kind of thing. It'll be exploding a little bit more. They'll be very fiery. A lot of heat will come. And with Kapha, you might not know because they won't say anything. There's a tendency to go inwards. Depression. What are, the, what are the consequences of these kind of uh, characteristics? 
an inability to get things out. That can be whether it's psychological and then also physical. We'll come on to how that works. And disease, disease, imbalance. So what kind of diseases have we had throughout our life? How have they shown? Have they been febrile diseases, heating diseases, uh, tendency towards fever and this kind of thing, more pitta related? Have they been neurological diseases, more related to vata? Or have they been diseases um, where to do with the lungs and we get a lot of uh, things that are bunged up, a lot of coughs and colds and this kind of thing to do with the, the area around the lungs? Or are we not able to vocalize what's going on? There's a number of different ways. So this is how we can look. What's going on in my life right now? Am I sleeping well? Are things going through my body well? How am I with other people? How is my temperament towards myself? Um, and how are things generally in terms of am I ill or am I quite healthy? So Ayurveda and disease. So Ayurveda states that uh, a lot of disease, it forms in the mind and permeates into the physical body. And there are primary sites where when it gets too much up here, it locates to first in the physical body. Um, only happens when doshas are too high. Disease and problems and, and, and in the mind and the body when doshas go too high. So I'll give you an example. I'm Pitta. So what's generally possibly going to happen for a Pitta person? I'm going to push myself too much, trying to get presentations done. I want to get it all done uh, amazingly well. Uh, I'll be putting myself under too much structure generally. I'll probably be eating hot, spicy food. I will gravitate towards the things that put me out of balance. If I'm practicing yoga, I'll be pushing too much. I'll be trying to achieve what this wants rather than what this is t uh, telling me to do. I might be using breath too strongly. I'll be overheating. Um, and what happens because of that? Then things start to go wrong in the body. I'll get, what's, what's a good example of what I could use? Things will go through the body too quickly. So things will over, overheat. So diarrhea. Things are showing themselves. Diarrhea is coming. What is diarrhea? It's an overheating of things, so they're coming out too quickly and too liquefied. What's the opposite of that? They're not coming out at all. This could be more to do with gas in the system, which is vata. It's air in the body. So this is how it starts to show itself. Wonderful human body. So where the doshas express imbalance. So there's three primary sites. When kapha goes out of balance, the first place when it gets too much in the mind that it will permeate into, it'll filter into in the physical body, is the chest and the lungs. What happens there? A lot of congestion, a lot of asthma, inability to, to breathe properly, to get things out or allow things to come in. Pitta, stomach and the small intestine. The small intestine is here. Okay, acid indigestion, heartburn, acid, burn. They're all heating elements. Um, also, the other thing that's here is heart. We'll come on to that. Vata, the primary site in the body that will show itself, is the large intestine and the colon. So, a vata person, because they will generally speak quite quickly like I'm doing right now, maybe whilst they're eating, because they'll be eating quickly, what's happening? Air is going in. What happens? We get gas. It's a very, very easy way to, to identify a vata kind of symptom. Does it make sense? No. When we talk with people, it's wonderful when we start to understand some of this because we can work with it on ourselves. How, how am I speaking? You know, if I'm just stopped talking right now, then I've introduced more kapha. I've slowed down. So what I've actually done is afforded the possibility of more balance for a thought to come through that might not have come through if I just kept talking on the rabbit wheel like this. So this is how you can use it like this straight away once you know what the characteristics are. So different diseases that relate differently to the doshas. Vata regulates the nervous system. So we're looking at this area of the body, the large intestine and the colon. We're also looking at what it does psychologically. The nervous system is what brings things around the body, passes things around. So a lot of uh, disease can tend to reflect itself in neurological instances if the vata is too high. Pitta, these aren't definitive, they're indications. When we have enough indications, we have the proof. Pitta is fevers, infectious diseases, and kapha, respiratory disorders, you know, the lungs getting bunged up, this kind of thing. So how can we balance it? Controllable influences and influences outside of our control. Controllable, diet and lifestyle. Outside of our control, times of day, times of the year, times of life, when these doshas are higher and lower for everybody. Okay, we'll talk a little bit on that. So, I'm not going to talk too much about diet because I want this to go into yoga asana. Diet is very, very important in Ayurveda. Okay? 
It's one of the controllable things that we can help regulate. Ayurveda recognizes six tastes, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, astringent, and pungent. When you understand the characteristics of those tastes and what they do to vata, pitta, kapha, then you can start to look at all the different foods that are good for you, rather than go, all the different millions of foods that are good for me, how does that fit? We start with the six tastes. This is an introduction, so I don't expect you to get all of this at the end. This is what Dr. Vijay, if you have consultation, and can go into individually for all of you. Okay. So the six tastes, what do they do? Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, sweet, sour, salty, a taste that are good to bring vata into balance. Why would that be? Okay, so salty, what does salt do? It absorbs water. What do vata people not have as much of? Water. So they tend not to drink that much water. Um, and if we use water as an example, Vata people won't gravitate towards it because it's not who they predominantly are, but they need more of it to balance themselves. And then the dry skin and the dry features would not be as dry also, because you're introducing more fluid into the body. Um, so that's just how salty can be introduced. But there's different layers with that, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, because different types of salt do different types of things. Um, but just to recognize that Ayurveda introduces six tastes. Each of those tastes is good for balancing the doshas in different ways. So vata, salty, sour, and sweet are good for balancing vata. Those same tastes aggravate pitta, and they aggravate uh, kapha, salty and sour. If you pungent is spicy and hot, pitta people are predominantly quite hot. If you add more spicy food into the diet, what will happen is you'll layer pitta on top of pitta on top of pitta. More pitta that comes up, more chance of imbalance, more chance of disease. So we're looking to control and balance these qualities. So within diet, we have to understand Agni and Ama. Agni is your digestive fire, which is regulated by pitta. All the food you put into your body gets processed, and as strong as the fire is, into the seven tissues of the body also. So if Agni isn't strong, and pitta and the fire is low, then the food that you eat will either get processed or not get processed into the system. Okay, so it's very important to understand Agni, what it does, and how it shows itself with different doshas. And then Amma is undigested food or toxins that show themselves. Uh, if you stick your tongue out, not at me, but generally in the mirror, then you'll see that quite often we have a coating on the tongue. Most people do, and it depends. If you just had a turmeric latte, you're gonna have more of a coating. So the coating on the tongue is an indication that the food and the drink that you've taken hasn't been digested properly because it still remains on the tongue. The tongue comes from the stomach. So that's a suggestion that the agni, the pitta, the fire, is quite low. If the agni and the pitta is high, and pitta people can normally eat pretty much anything and process it, then the tongue will generally be clearer. So in a healthy person, generally the tongue will be clearer because the agni, the digestion, is working properly. Okay? So other controllable influences, lifestyle. For me, in many ways, mind precedes body, okay? Because if I'm doing things in certain ways, then that will basically um, control what's going on with the physical body. Mind precedes body in many, uh, mind precedes uh, body, lifestyle precedes diet in many ways. And quite often when people come to me about Ayurveda, they go, yeah, my diet, it's all over the place, and they're not really thinking about lifestyle. And the two need to be balanced within Ayurveda. So how do we spend our time? What has an influence on whether lifestyle can put us in and out of balance? What are the times available to us? Work time, personal time, personal practice, yoga mat, family time, eating time, rest time. So how we look at these chunks of time in our day, we can control some of them, we can't control others. I speak to people sometimes, they go, I'm sitting at this office desk, I have to spend 80% of my time doing this. So how can I create balance? And I go, well, where do you eat your lunch? Uh, how do you get to work? Uh, what do you do with the other 20% of your time? Balance comes in where we can make it easy and practical and not force it. If you try and force something, you go on a honeymoon with something, and then you get divorced from it within two weeks, right? If you try and implement too much of this information in the first week, it won't have any sustainability. I had a friend once, I sometimes tell this story, he, I was doing Ashtanga many years ago, and, and I loved it, and I still do, and I was saying, you've got to do this practice, it's amazing, it'll change your life, because it was changing mine. 
And he was like, yeah, yeah, great, okay. And um, so I was like, oh, I'm preaching, I'll just I'll move away. I saw him about a month later, he goes, oh, I'll try that Ashtanga thing. Doesn't work. Okay, fine, fair enough, whatever. Um, what did you try? Half an hour, didn't work. Mm, okay, so what is affordable to us and how do we apportion it in our life to give it a chance of balance? Quite often what's needed is patience and time, which is the two things that Vata and Pitta don't normally want to introduce. So our time is influenced by what we do, how we go about things, uh, and when we do them. And so this is very, very pertinent when it comes to yoga asana as well, as we'll look into. I mean, I think we all know it's not just what the asana is, it's how we're doing it and when we're doing it. It has a huge influence. Um, times of year, times of the day, times of life. We can't control these. Okay, so Ayurveda when we look at vata, vata is higher, vata, this energy of vata is higher for everybody at certain times of our life, certain times of the day, certain seasons. So vata time of day, 2 to 6 a.m. and p.m., 2 a.m., 6 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m. This is when vata for everybody is highest. So if I'm already vata predominant, and I know that, and I'm working with vata to balance it, during these times, vata will be higher for me generally. So I'm needing to introduce more kapha to bring this down generally, okay? Pitta is highest between 10 and 2, a.m. and p.m. So this thing about eating your main meal be uh, between 10 and 2 is because pitta is higher in everybody, which means the agni, the digestive fire, is at its strongest. So to eat your main meal generally for people at lunchtime makes a lot of sense. If I am kapha predominant and I have my main meal at kapha time between 6 and 10 p.m., let's say, the digestive fire is not very strong. So what tends to happen is kapha people tend to skip breakfast because it takes them a while to get going and they've probably had their main meal late the night before so they're still digesting dinner. So when it comes to breakfast, I'm not hungry yet. So they'll then tend to take some while to get going, around lunchtime start to eat but not have too much. They'll graze all day, they'll have their main meal in the evening. So when we look at that and within the times of the day when these energies are higher, to have your main meal, if you're already kapha, at that time, it's not allowing the food to get burnt or processed into the seven tissues of the body. So it's going to remain in the stomach for longer. Very, very simple ways that we have to fit ourselves into the times of the day that we can't change. It's the same for everybody. So we have to look at our constitution, fit it in to the times of the day, times of life, times of the year. Climate has a huge influence as well. You've all just come from maybe different climates. You've probably maybe come from colder to hotter. So what effect does that have? Hotter climate is more pitta, colder is more kapha. How does this affect us? Times of year. So generally, summer, unless you're in England, tends to be hotter, and that's pitta time. Winter tends to be more kapha time. And changeable times of the year, autumn, spring, things are changing. This is more vata. Times of life. So, kapha time. Zero to puberty, generally, is kapha time. So, you know, it takes people a while to get younger. When we're kids, we don't want to get out of bed. We want to sleep till midday, this kind of thing. It takes them a while to get going. From puberty to 50, 55, generally menopause for women is pitta time of life. Well, what is that? It's when we're trying to achieve things, when we're trying to build things, family, home, careers, how we define ourselves in the world. These are all very structured things, and they're all very achieving things. This is pitta time of life. And all those characteristics are characteristics of fire focused, achieving, all this kind of thing. And then we come on to vata stage of life. So generally, 50, 55, menopause onwards. It's when the body's going into decay. But remember, we're just talking about mind and body here when we're talking about doshas. We're not talking about spirit at the moment. So what tends to happen as we get older, we get more wrinkly, uh, a lot of fluid goes, we get more arthritis, different diseases happen at different times of our life quite often. It's quite unusual to have someone that has arthritis when they're younger, but when they get older, they get it. What is arthritis? It's air in the joints, it's vata. So that's vata stage of life. So different diseases and different things happen at different stages of our lives. Um, so more drying out happens uh, at vata stage. So how can we balance these things? Well, the first thing is we understand our unique constitution our prakriti, we understand what's currently out of balance, so we understand our vikriti, we work with vikriti first, 
And then we're conscious of the times of the day, the year and our life and the climate we're in that have an effect that we can't control. And then what we can control, more consciously aligning our diet and lifestyle based on who we are in terms of our biological constitution. So how can I design a life that fits and balances who, my true nature rather than forcing things or rather forcing squares into round holes all the time? So it's not just what we do, but how we do it. And how we do it leads us on to our spiritual, mental constitution, which we can change at any one minute. Okay? So we have th three things. Gunas, your mental and spiritual constitution. And we have tamas. Tamas is the more lethargic, the more grounded kind of energy. We have all three of these at any one time. Okay? It's just how we balance them. So I have an idea. An idea comes to me. I want to put that idea into practice. This is rajas. It's, it's basically the alchemy. It's taking something and working with it and, and really focusing on it. The tamas will be, let me just hold back from that and just, just before we rush ahead, uh, rajas, let me just ask a question about that. So there's a slight pause. There's a balance that's created with that. Rajas doesn't rush ahead. That balance, when it all comes together, is called sattva. The balance, the clarity of the other two being aligned. This is our mental spiritual constitution. And what happens is, generally we're trying to introduce more of a sattvic lifestyle into the way we live, into the way we practice yoga, more of a balance. A balance based on the knowledge of who we are. And I'm not going to go too much more into that right now. So how do I cultivate this sattva, Justin? Well, what happens is, and this is where it gets really interesting from a spiritual point of view. Um, and I'm going to give a few examples of how I can do this in yoga because it's more relevant to what you guys are doing right now. But effectively, a sattvic lifestyle is a lifestyle where we're introducing more selfless acts, more patience, more time. Can I bring more time in for myself rather than doing for others? A pitta predominant person will be constantly doing, focused and achieving. And what are they missing? Time for myself. How can I pull that back? Heart center, time for myself. Where does pitta reside in the body? Happens to be this area. What are these postures? When we start looking at postures, they're heart openers. So giving myself self-love. How I'm practicing things, how I'm going about things. Am I trying to do too much? Am I pushing myself? Am I pushing others? And am I eating the wrong things? Am I constantly doing them? How can I look at this and how can I work with it to create more balance? And this is sattvic lifestyle. You know, as I was saying earlier, I was talking and I was talking and I was talking and I was continuing and I was continuing and if I just stopped, That pause is allowing more balance. So, how I'm eating. Okay, I'm conscious that I'm, I'm really talking, I'm eating, I'm really trying to explain to this person about what I did today. It was so exciting, I really want them to get it, you know, so I really want to explain this. Can I just hold back from that? Can I create a bit of space? You know, how can I create this sattvic lifestyle? Um, so, mindful, conscious awareness in diet and lifestyle and yoga practice. So it's the pause. When we start to do a lot of meditation, you know, there's this inner buffer. We're less reactive. We have more time with ourselves. And what is, what is this, this, this purpose of that? It allows other thoughts and creativity to come through. A lot of ideas can come through when we create time for ourselves. So sattvic di life, uh, diet, what is it? It's what we eat, but it's how we eat, and it's when we're eating. So I'm bringing more conscious awareness, not just the foods that I'm eating, but when I'm eating those foods and how I'm eating. So if I'm vata predominant, am I talking a lot whilst I'm eating? Or am I being a little bit more quiet? It doesn't have to be all the time. Okay? We, we can't not be who we are. Don't not be a vata person. Don't not be a pitta person. But learn how to balance it. So I can do that not just by what I eat, that's part of it, but how I'm eating, when I'm eating it, what are the times of the day. So a vata person will tend to eat a lighter diet, foods that grow more on the surface. So how can I consciously bring more awareness into that? Well, if I'm in a hot climate, fine, I'm probably going to eat more light, dry food. Um, but maybe they're more soups, and they could be cold soups. What's the soup made of? Root vegetables. What's a root vegetable? It's the opposite of vata. It's more grounded. So this is how you can bring it in. And then what times of the day am I eating and what? Um, Savic lifestyle. Again, the same considerations, what, how, and when. What am I doing it? How am I doing it? When am I doing it? Conscious awareness. So 
personal time, work. Some, some big questions come when we look at Ayurveda in our lives and we practically apply it. Quite often we get to a point when we're going, I'm spending my time, 80% of my time in a job that isn't serving me. This tends to happen when we start doing a lot of yoga, right? We start to get a clarity of who we are and how we'd like to flow in the world that maybe wasn't there before. <laughs> so sattvic yoga practice, Let, let's, let's go into yoga practice. We're trying to bring more awareness and mindfulness into our practice. Now we can do that with the aid of ourselves and a good teacher quite often. But how can we do that using Ayurveda? Okay, so if I'm looking at the factors I need to consider. Ayurveda considers that yoga is the main tool to bring in alignment to the physical body. Okay, so we start working with postures and then we start working with breath. This will allow us a greater opportunity for the spirit, the self-knowledge to come through. Now, you all probably know this by doing the yoga practice that you're doing. There is a lot more inquisitiveness that's maybe coming into your life. I'm doing this yoga practice, I'm moving and breathing in this particular way and it's, something's changing in me. I, I feel a bit more patient, I feel a bit more, I've got more vitality, I'm a bit more creative, I've got all these other things that are coming in. Well, what is that? This is this, starting to open, this is self-knowledge. It's gone through a process where we're starting to align ourselves through yoga to allow spiritual nature, love, or whatever word you want to put for it, to come through more. Um, so what are these factors that I need to consider? Well, what asanas are good for what dosha? And before we look at that, we need to look at what movements are good for what dosha. Okay? And the manner and the attitude of which I'm practicing. Okay, so I'm not going to get on the floor because the camera's on me, but at this stage, what I quite often do is a pitta predominant person, focused, very driven, drishti, really focused, breath very deep, a lot of sweat coming. So how I'm practicing that, maybe I go into the posture a little bit slower. I've got five breaths there, don't have to get there on the first breath, right? So maybe I'm, the manner of which I'm practicing is changing. I'm bringing more conscious awareness just into it like that. And that's very good from a pitta point of view. Kapha point of view, you know, I'm probably going to be a little bit like, you know, a little bit more lethargic. So I need to bring in more precision, more focus, a little bit more pitta. So it's how I can start working with that. Also being honest about the level of which we're at with a particular asana not trying to overachieve before we're ready. Okay, um, I'll put some examples in uh, that we're coming on to. Uh, there's only a few more slides to go which really go into Vata, Pitta, Kapha, Yoga-wise. Uh, strong focus on breath. Focus, not strong. Focus being the main word, okay? Strong, yeah, we might need more strong, more vocal breath if we're trying to heat the body more. If I'm Pitta, maybe I need to moderate the breath. I can still hear it, it's still got length. Equal inhale, equal exhale. But it's not quite, I can't hear it over there if I'm sitting here. You know, it's a little less vigorous, let's say. Whereas vata, I want to lengthen and deepen the breath. Because for a vata person, they're very much on the surface. What's next? Next posture. You know, drishti. That's cool. Look at that over there, you know. So how can I bring more focus with that, with drishti? <laughs> and it can be fun, this as well, right? Um, and how can I work with that with breath? So breath I can use differently for every single dosha. This is bringing more conscious awareness into my yoga practice based on who I am from a biological constitution. Uh, and when you're practicing, you know, times of day, when are the doshas higher? So if, if pitta is higher between 10 and 2, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., if I'm doing a very vigorous asana practice then, I'm layering pitta onto a time of the day that's already quite high with pitta. So pitta's more likely to go out of balance. Whereas if I practice yoga asana between say 6 and 10 in the morning, which is kapha time, and the energy generally for everybody is lower, and I'm doing a flowing yoga practice, I'm balancing that. This is how we use it. So, vata, good old vata. We talk a lot about it. There's a reason for that. Vata, um, I think something like 70 something percent of all disease in the world today is vata related. Very, very simple explanation for that is a lot of people work in an office, a lot of people work in a city, a lot of people rush, Everything needs to be done yesterday. They're on the computer screen, tapping into the nervous system. Everything's getting overstimulated. So vata goes out of balance more often than not. So I tend to talk about vata a lot because quite often people are dealing more with vata than they are the other doshas. So to understand how to balance it, I look at the characteristics. Vata is light, airy, fast, erratic, and dry. These are some of the words that can go with vata predominant. So to balance that, I need the opposite. 
calming for the nervous system, grounding, focus, warming, strengthening, structure. A lot of ideas, Vata, structure, bring them down, let's work with two. So how does that work in a yoga practice? Anatomical focus, colon, large intestine, this area of the body. So what, what can I do that's helping to balance and pacify that part of the body? And then the psychological focus, calming the nervous system. So if we think of that very, very simplis, uh, simplistically, when you go upside down and the, and the blood goes to the head, you're calming the nervous system. So inversions can be very good. Level of practitioner. If we're doing shoulder stand and we've never done it before, we put a lot of pressure on the cervical spine maybe. The joints are normally weaker in vata. So we need to go, okay, I'm quite new to this. Inversions are good. Maybe I put my legs up against the wall. Maybe I do shoulder stand with a blanket underneath to give support. Mindful, conscious awareness into my practice. Being honest with where I'm at. Pitta. The psychological characteristics and also the physical, fiery, heating, a lot of sweat comes, focused, uh, strong will, competitive, structured. I like this system, don't want to, if I've got that, I'm, I'm good. Anything out of that, I get a bit. To balance that, generally, we need the opposites. So calming, self-acceptance, compassion, a little bit more listening to the heart than the head, not pushing as much, a little bit of creativity, going off piste with the yoga uh, uh, sometimes, you know, doing slightly different sequences and putting some variety in there. Moderate pacing. There's still a pace there. There's still a fluidity. It's still a vinyasa, but I'm slowing it down a little bit or I'm let it, less emphasis on the breath, more emphasis on exhalation for pitta. Exhalation is not just cooling, it's letting go. Quite often you hear the term inhale, exhale, letting go. Inhale is the focus. Exhale is letting go into the posture that you find. Inhale, strength. Exhale depth, letting go into the posture. This is how the exhale lets go with pitta, and, and you can work with that on the breath as well. Anatomical focus, small intestine in the stomach. So again, what postures are doing what for this heart area, what open these areas of the body rather than close them? And then the psychological focus, heart-centered, more self-love, a little bit more creativity. And then how to balance kapha, kapha characteristics. What are they? Heavy, damp, cold, stability, dullness, takes a while to get going, but has a lot of stamina. So to balance that, we're looking at the opposites. So a bit more heat, a bit more lightness, a bit more mobility, a bit more stimulation, uh, a bit more sharpness and focus, so a bit, more, a bit more drishti, working with the breath more, trying to get some heat. Anatomical focus, stomach and the chest, the lungs. How do we open the lungs? More vinyasa, get the body moving, open the lungs up, this kind of thing. So challenging ourselves, but Within that challenge, recognizing and being honest where we're currently at, okay? So not pushing too much. Um, the benefit of a good teacher. The teacher can see this with us and they can work with it. Um, so discover what your prakriti is. Discover what the vikriti is. Understand the physical and the mental characteristics. So if I can understand them, I know how to work with them. It's a better foundation. Um, then it's not just Ashtanga, you can put this into any yoga practice. Because I know that if I'm doing a standing forward bend, the head is below the heart, so I'm pacifying the nervous system. But if I'm practicing it in such a way that I'm really forced and it's really stressful, I'm not being honest, so I bend my knees a little bit. But the head is still below the heart. If I'm Pitta, I can look at certain postures. We've actually filmed something with Purple Valley that will go into, and this will be free on the YouTube channel. What different postures, what anatomical movements are good for vata, pitta, and kapha predominant. So you can have a look at that as well, but that will be coming out shortly. And that will go into more detail. But you start with understanding mental and physical characteristics. Who am I? What's currently going on? What are the counter characteristics to help bring balance in diet and lifestyle? Yoga within lifestyle. And then how do I apply it? Well, don't try and apply it all in one go. And there's this wonderful thing, 80-20 rule in life, not just in Ayurveda. 80% of the time, do what you know to be good for yourself. 20% of the time, give yourself a break. Because if you're too rigid with any of this, with its diet or lifestyle or yoga within that, it won't be sustainable. It may be one year, five years, 10 years, one week, and it will not work anymore because too much was tried to be introduced too quickly. So lifestyle is be patient, allow it to come in over time, when I'm looking at yoga within this, what's really, really useful for me is as soon as I know what my dosha is, I can work with it the next day. Um, 
So bow posture, you know, all these kind of heart openers, upward dog, cobra, what is it doing? Bring more intellect into our yoga asana. What is this posture actually doing? Well, it's opening this area. So it's a heart opener, it's good for pitta. Anything in this region that's doing that is good for pitta. It doesn't have to be specific postures, it can be the movement. So the transitions also become very important. Uh, if I know that kapha needs generally more stimulation in yoga asana, then the sun salutes is going to be my starting point. And the focus on breath and the drishti, which gives focus. Uh, these, and these are just general movements that you can bring in. They don't have to be specific postures. And then for vata, the number one thing, and this will be recognizable in our own practices, vata people, chuk, 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 chuk through the practice, breath, <laughs> very light on the surface. Shavasana, two minutes. Done. What's next? Breakfast, coffee, maybe. Um, so, what's the first thing that we can bring in that's simple and anybody can do it? Longer relaxation. At least 10 minutes. For an hour's asana practice, at least 10 minutes shavasana. And you know the benefits of that when you do it. So don't take my word for this. Try it. This is the whole thing. This is where it has to become, through an experience, to become self-knowledge. And as soon as you do and it works, you'll go, what was the other stuff to do with vata or pitta? And you'll go deeper. And then it becomes sustainable. Okay. So, thank you for listening. I know it's warm, and uh, thank you for your attention. I hope this is of some use. This is an introduction. The next step, as I said, is to, not that you have to, but if, if it's leading you there, is to understand what your biological constitution is, what your prakriti is, and understand the current state of health. And then straight away, within the next week or two weeks, this yoga practice can be a lot different for you. It can be more informed and more deep also, as well as what you're eating and how you're spending your time. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.